So, so hello, everybody. Um, it's really exciting. We're starting off our kickoff for the AP Colloquium series. Uh, my name is Gertina Fesla. I guess I'm interim chair uh, at the moment, so we're trying to figure out the future of the TAP program. So one of the things I wanted to let you all know is that we are in the process of thinking about what is TAP. And um, so there are a number of faculty in each department that are our TAP steering committee members. So if you have thoughts about where you'd like the future of this program to go, please contact your uh, TAP steering committee member. Um, and we, an important part of the TAP program is both the Colquim series and our student research prize. So first for the Colquim series, Caitlin, would you like to say a few words? Yes, uh, welcome back everyone. I think this semester we have six talks in person. So very exciting. Um, so we hope to see all of you and many more here. Uh, the current TAP colloquium committee is me, Luke Krause and Eric Asfog. So if you have suggestions for future semesters, please feel free to uh, send us an email. There's also a link that we sent out over the summer that's still active. So you can always just submit suggestions there. You don't have to wait for us to prompt you. And the other thing I just want to remind you of is that the one thing that has always been really special about this talk series compared to like many at the university is that it's super interactive and low key. So please feel free, I can really to interrupt the speaker all the time. That's what makes this colloquium series really fun and why I'm really happy to have people back in person. Um, and with that, I'm going to give the honor the honors of the All right. Yeah, so I'll just say a quick word, which is simply that the TAP program, one of the things that's really amazing about it is the Student Research Prize. And this is a prize that goes to a graduate student who has submitted a phenomenal paper that has really made an impact in an area of theoretical astrophysics from uh, the student be from planetary sciences, from physics, or from astronomy. And so this year's prize winner is Gabriele Botzela. And so we're very excited to have him give our colloquium here today. And so let's, let's go ahead. All right. All right, so uh, it is truly my pleasure to introduce Gabriele Botola, uh, who's going to be giving today's talk at the time of Um Gabriele started uh, here at the university working with me uh, basically almost four years ago. <laughs> uh, and he's done phenomenal work, phenomenal job. Uh, the work that he will be presenting today, I just, I, I just think it's interesting to just give you uh, some insight on how this thing developed. Um, so he was taking my high energy astrophysics class that I was teaching it. And he, um, I, I didn't want the students to just work on homework only. And so I wanted them to do work on a project that they would like. It could be just summarizing some work or some just doing some original uh, research work if they wanted to. So Gabriela came to my office and he's like, you know, there's this uh, very nice solution in general relativity. It's called the Majumdar Papa Petri solution that I had never heard of. I didn't even know what it was. And so he explained to me that it's basically two black holes are just sitting there and they're charged with maximal charge that people probably talk about during his talk. I'm like, okay, so why is that interesting? Like, <laughs> just two things just sitting there it doesn't make any sense. I'm like, what do you want to make out of it? So I just started thinking about, just he got me thinking about, it. I'm like, oh, maybe if we perturb it, we can actually make an, an antenna a gravitational wave antenna from charged black holes, like a dipole antenna that emits gravitational waves, but now it's not gonna be dipole, of course, but we will have dipole emission from electromagnetic waves. Anyway, so that project took off into a completely different direction that he's gonna summarize and highlight what he's done today. Uh, but it's that's where it started. Uh, I just wanted to say that this just shows the drive that Gabriele has as a student, and I have been very, very uh, blessed to have him work with me. With that, um, I guess with the graduate student prize, he also gets this plaque. So I'm going to present it to you. Congratulations. The floor is yours. Take it away. Thanks. I'm very honored to be here. And I'm very excited to tell you about what we've learned over the past few years about well, fundamental physics, a very broad definition of what fundamental physics is using computer simulations of charged black holes. And I first, I want to acknowledge that this research has been, you know, was made possible by the support of a funding agency, particularly NASA with its finest fellowship and the Texas Fund Center for Computing with its Frontier Fellowship that supported me for the past three years, as well as NSF that supported Passeus Group for the past few years as well. So with that out of the way, I want to remind you of one of the most important milestones in the history of general relativity. This is the Noether theorem. The Noether theorem says that, you know, at the end of the day, single isolated black holes are not that complex. You just need three numbers to describe them. You need its mass. Let's see if I can use this. 
mass, angular momentum, and charge. And that's it. You don't need anything else. This was a really important result. It took decades of efforts to reach this, this what I call milestone. And now I'll make a maybe controversial statement. Now I think that we understand isolated black holes quite well. And we understand them in their full expression as objects that have mass, angular momentum, and charge. But the issue is that the, this is no longer the case when we move to a binary bubble. So for binary systems, there's lots of areas where we don't know much about that. In particular, we don't know almost anything about binary black holes with charge. I'd say that the area of nonlinear, so when two black holes are very close, interaction of charged black holes is severely underexplored. This means that we don't know anything about orbits, waveforms, interaction. We don't know what happens when you take two black holes, you give them charge, and you make them interact. And this is a problem. And I'm going to, I'm going to try to convince you, or I'm going to tell you why I think this is a really interesting area to explore, why there is lots of potential for future applications for in several different areas of astrophysics and physics that hinge upon this new linear interaction between charged black holes. But before I get into that, I want to tell you about a convention I'm going to use throughout this talk. I'm going to use units in which the speed of light, the gravitational constant, and the permittivity of vacuum, they're all set to one. And if you're not familiar with these units, it's not a problem. I'm just going to ask you to remember two things. First is that in these units, we can measure charge and mass with the same units. So we can talk about charge mass ratio. And the charge mass ratio is a number. It's one, 10, 1,000, whatever. There's no units attached to charge to mass ratio. Second, in these units, the charge to mass ratio for a fundamental particle, let's say a proton or an electron, same. It's a very, very, very large number. If you focus on protons, then it's of order of 10 to the 18. Uh, the reason I like these units so much is twofold. First, this number here encodes that electromagnetism is much, much, much stronger than gravity. So if you restore all the Gs and epsilon and Cs, you're going to find that this is just a statement that electromagnetism is much, much stronger than gravity. And second, these units highlight that we shouldn't think as mass and charge as two completely separate entities. Indeed, what matters is only the charge to mass ratio. So the results I'm going to present today apply for microscopic black holes, supermassive black holes, stellar mass black holes. It's always, as long as you uh, think about charge to mass ratio, that's what matters. It doesn't matter as long as also you ignore quantum effects, which we're going to do. What matters is only the charge to mass ratio. So, and with these units, we can make this explicit. So now I'm going to spend the next few minutes to tell you about areas where I think that the lack of understanding of how the nonlinear interaction between charged black holes is essentially holding us from more interesting science discovery. Uh, for example, I'm going to start with astrophysics. We are in the era of gravitational wave astronomy. This is very good, the gravitational wave detector that we have in, in Italy. We can do a lot of amazing science with Virgo. The problem is that we cannot and we do not have any way to understand properties of black holes with charge if we don't understand the linear interaction of black holes with charge. So we cannot use gravitational waves to, for example, constrain or charge black holes using uh, current data from uh, gravitational wave observatories. I'm going to spend the second half of this talk about this. So I'm going to go ahead. Uh, but this is one of the most important applications is that for gravitational wave astronomy, it's really critical that we understand and characterize the nonlinear interaction between charged black holes. And also, if you're willing to move to less comfortable territory and move to exotic astrophysics, there's plenty of theories that require us to understand better about the nonlinear interaction between charged black holes. For example, theories involving dark matter. You can have a dark potent, you can have a mini charged dark matter, you can have a magnetic monopoles. And there's recent work that shows that actually primordial black holes, maybe, maybe they are charged. In specific mass and charge ranges, we should expect primordial black holes to be charged. But to constrain all these theories, to rule them out, to place bounds of something that maybe is completely exotic that doesn't exist, we must 
understand more about the nonlinear interaction between charged black holes. Again, when we uh, have two black holes very close so that their interaction is very strong. And we can also move away from pure astrophysics and go back to what people did in the previous century. People that studied charged black holes, in my opinion at least, were driven by the idea that you can play with two of the fundamental forces. You can play with gravity and you can play with electromagnetics. And at the time of Einstein, these were the only fundamental forces that you had. So people, for example, look for unified theories of gravity. And I think that studying the nonlinear interaction between charged black holes is a great way to go back to those roots and use this as a laboratory for testing our theories, for understanding what happens if we push our theories to their most extreme. For example, if I take two black holes, I make them collide extremely fast. And what happens? Do, do, I, do I break them? Do I get some naked singularity? Do I get what type of mission do I get? There's a plenty of conjectures, plenty of ideas that we all throw in our study of general activity that should be tested in this super dynamical, extreme environment. I think the nonlinear interaction between charged black hole unlocks a completely new area of investigation of extreme. Uh, let's say events like again collision of charged black holes with ultra uh, ultra relativistic collisions of charged black holes. And again, if we stay in this region of going back to our fundamental theories, maybe we should also question if GR is the correct theory. So I think charged black holes are quite useful to say modify gravity as well. In recent years, again because of gravitational waves, there has been a lot of interest for modified gravity. To see if we can constrain GR, or we can find even better, find deviations of GR, because that will be huge. In the future, it's going to be even better. We're going to have awesome instruments. We're going to have the laser interferometer space antenna. These instruments are going to allow us to constrain the theory of gravity, hopefully. But for that, we have to understand deviations from GR. And the interaction of uh, the nonlinear interaction between charged black holes is a great way to do so. One, it's what I call the springboard. There's modified theories of gravity that start from charged black holes. So if we have solutions with charged black holes, we can consider those modified theories of gravity. There's modified theories of gravity that in specific limits reduce to being described exactly as if they were charged black holes. But also more in general, many modified theories of gravity are very, very difficult to study. There's fundamental mathematical problems, wall poseness, ghosts, that limit what we can do with modified theories of gravity. It's impossible to run simulations for specific modified theories of gravity. Nonetheless, charged black holes have a very similar phenomenology. For example, we have dipole emission, which is what you don't have dipole emission for traditional vacuum GR, but many modified theories of gravity have dipole emission. So we can use charged black holes as a way to understand our biases. If we are, if we are able to resolve modifications of gravity or not. So this is another area that we'll, we can explore, we, we will explore if you, once we have the ability to perform simulations to study the nonlinear interaction between charged particles. And finally, I want to leave astrophysics almost completely, and I want to think about particle physics. We can use interaction, nonlinear interaction of charged particles to study uh, the Large Hadron Collider or particle colliders. I don't know if you remember, but a few years ago, I think it was 2012, when LHC was uh, running at se seven teleelectron volt, people were really worried that we will form microscopic black holes, swallow our planet. <laughs> I, I wouldn't be here to tell you about this. It didn't happen, but it doesn't mean that we're not looking for it. It doesn't mean that the study of microscopic black holes mm. in particle accelerator or cosmic ray has died. We are still using particle accelerators in cosmic rays to understand more about, once again, gravity. But for that, if we want to have accurate models of how microscopic black holes form and dissipate and interact, you must resolve the nonlinear interaction between charged black holes. So if you want to have cross-sections, if you want to have electromagnetic signature that your gamma ray detector is a measure, you must have a deep understanding of how the nonlinear interaction of charged black holes work. So these are some of the uh, fields, areas. Uh, this is the scientific potential of uh, uh, studying the nonlinear, nonlinear interaction of charged black holes. There's lots of interesting science that can be done with this tool. Or if we unlock that, 
there's plenty of questions that are just waiting to be answered. And this list is incomplete, if I can. I'm sure there's more. And maybe if you, you can help me, if you, if you think that there is something else I should add here, please get in touch. I'm very interested in, uh, in learning what we can do with this amazing tool. So, so this is P1, is my research program for the next 10 years, or part of it at least. Uh, this is part of what we've done. And today, I'm going to focus on a spe one specific aspect of this. But before, I want to tell you about our approach. How are we going to solve this problem of no linear interaction between charged black holes? And for that, I, I'm going to go to the chalkboard, and I'm going to write all the equations that we need, and which fit on order of a board. We just need the Einstein-Maxwell's equations. Einstein-Maxwell's equations, they look scary. They have all these indexes, so they, they are space-time equations. But at the end of the day, they are just the relativistic version of your usual Poisson equation and your usual uh, Maxwell's equations that we, we all study in, uh, in our uh, physics classes. But for the specific case that we're interested in here, the case of binary black holes with charge, well, that's much more difficult. We have no symmetries. We, we cannot access any perturbative technique where we want to solve the problem in full generality. And the big difference between the equations that we have here on top and the equations that we have here at the bottom, the equations that we have here are highly nonlinear, highly coupled, they are a mess. It's really, really difficult to solve Einstein's equations. So the tool of investigation, the way I'm going to solve this problem is with numerical relativity. So numerical relativity is this, is we break the beautiful description that we had in the previous page, where we, we can write the equation in a half board, a quarter of a, of a slide. We, we break that, we destroy the space-time idea, and we restore an idea of time evolution. So we have some initial data, and we evolve the initial data, and we reconstruct the space-time slice after slice after slice. This is one possible approach to numerical relativity. So we cast the problem as an initial value problem. And people did this already 60 years ago for the, the vacuum case, the case without Maxwell. And they found that this is a very difficult problem. Once again, it took decades to solve this problem. People found problems with stability, gauge, initial data. It was very, very, very hard to solve this problem. But now, so hard that a completely new field, numerical relativity, essentially grew out of the attempts to solve the problem of binary black holes in vacuum. But now, I think we, we kind of know how to solve the problem for the most part. I think we have enough know-how, enough skills, enough tools that we can solve the problem of binary black holes, at least in vacuum. So I'd say I definitely stand on the shoulders of giants because I can take what people did in the previous six decades and I can apply to a new case that was not considered as considered or the other cases. So I'm going to follow this approach. I'm going to solve the fundamental equations that describe charged black holes, and I'm going to use numerical relativity for that. So in this talk, I'm going to tell you a little bit, not too much, about uh, the uh, advancements, the new formalisms, tools, ideas, some of the challenges that we had to face to be able to run the first numerical relativity simulations of quasi circular mergers of black holes. And second, I'm going to focus on one single application for this amazing new tool that is a physical application using this new tool to constrain the charged black holes with gravitation. And as Caitlin said, I'm very happy if you ask me questions. I'm very happy if you, you know, if you, in, in a few weeks, I'll be around for the next year, by the way, I'm for <laughs> uh, it, it, the QX, you want to come to my office and chat, or you want to send me an email, I'll, I'm very happy to, to discuss, uh, discuss about this. And I'm going to focus only on one specific block, astrophysics. There's much more that we've done that uh, it didn't fit in this slide. So uh, you know, if you're interested in fundamental physics, uh, first principles, whatever, I have that. So let's start with numerical relativity. So here I'm going to give you a sense of some of the challenges that we have to face. First is generation of initial data. This is a really challenging problem. Generate initial data means solving a system of partial differential equations, nonlinear partial differential equations, elliptic nonlinear partial differential equations, coupled elliptic nonlinear partial differential equations, <laughs> and so that we can at least start our simulations. And you know, once we have initial data, it doesn't mean that we understand what's inside. 
There's a second fundamental step that is understanding what, what's the physical content of our simulation. So, so for the initial data, we extended formalisms that were proposed in the past to accommodate for the case of Einstein Maxwell, uh, so that we can simulate or we can generate initial data for binary black holes with charge. And for interpretation, for the first time, we implemented a full expression of the quasi-isolated formalism. Uh, so it's an idea to define quasi-locally what's a black hole, what's its mass, what's its spin, what's its charge. Uh, for the first time, we implemented this in numerical relativity, including charge. So now we have initial data, and we understand what's in this initial data. So we have one block over here, one block over here, charge, charge, mass. We understand that. We can, we can run simulations. And this, by itself, is a paper. It's, this is challenging. Um, once we have the initial data, well, we can evolve it. And to evolve the initial data, we have a Maxwell solver, we have an Einstein solver. And yes, we have the same problems as everyone had before. We will run it into issues of stability. Our simulations will just crash. And that, that's a, if you want a physical crash or a numerical crash, it's not. It, it's something that has to be taken care of if we want to run the simulation for, for as long as we want to. So for that, we develop a, a new numerical technique to control errors that arise from high frequencies on our grid. We call this continuous dissipation, and we found that this just works. Uh, of course, this was not our first attempt. It was you know, this plenty of fail uh, attempts, but we found that this numerical technique allows us to perform, for the first time, long-term simulations of the quasi-sequence spiral of charged black holes. And this is, is, is quite nice because, you know, here, we're not just developing tools for, for, for studying charged black holes. This is a tool that can be applied broadly in the field of numerical relativity. And you know, at this point, numerical relativity itself is not perfect. There's plenty of areas where we could improve as a community so that we, we can perform better simulations, longer simulations, more accurate simulations. And this is an example of where we can push the state of the art of the field, looking at a specific application that in our case is charged black holes. And finally, once you have your simulation, well, that's not the end of the day. You have to understand what are the physical observables that come out of your simulation. How much angular momentum is lost through emission of electromagnetic waves? How much energy? And for that, once again, no one implemented this formalism for Einstein Maxwell and numerical relativity. So there was quite some work to be done uh, to implement the full expression of the so-called Newman Perros formalism, which is a way to extract observables from our simulations, taking into account electromagnetic fields as well. So with that, yes. Before you go, can you say a little bit more about the numerical stability techniques and maybe make some comparisons to like standard MHD simulations? I mean, are the problems at all similar? Uh, is there overlap? Uh, okay, so so this problem, uh, so the problem, okay, uh, the problem that this technique is solving is um, high frequency modes that typically arise from the grid, and they are typically not present in geometry simulations because you have a natural dissipation. So this is uh, artificial dissipation that kills a high frequency mode, but it's a special artificial dissipation. It's an artificial dissipation that is designed, one, to converge a higher order compared to our scheme, which means that it shouldn't affect the physical simulation itself, but second, it's designed to be con continuous along the grid. This will make more sense in a second when I'm going to tell you that our simulations are multi-grid. So there's multiple resolutions. So before, people still use some form for artificial dissipation, but there were discontinuities on the solid interfaces. With this, we remove those discontinuities. It's a continuous prescription, and it kills the high frequency, what we call constrained violated modes. And those modes are, are what essentially lead to this uh, growing error. So essentially, it's a way to reduce numerical noise if you want. But this, uh, well, as it is, you don't translate immediately to GMHD, but Vasilis did some work in which the idea of having continuous operator over the grid can be translated to something that improves convergence. So this idea is, is quite powerful. And again, it, it has to do with uh, PDA theory and continuities, continuity on the grid. We can discuss more if you're interested. Uh, but now I'm going to tell you a little bit about our numerical setup. So, well, we have our new code for initial data to charge, to charge puncture. Our simulations are on a grid, and, and it's a Cartesian grid, and it's a multi-resolution grid. So there's multiple resolutions. There's refinement centers that move the black holes. 
then we have a bunch of diagnostics. We have a space time solver. We have a, a Maxwell solver. There are coupled. And I develop an amazing new post processing tool called Vivid. It's very cute. Uh, but you know, probably these words mean nothing to you. So I'm going to translate uh, this as a for a computational person. So again, we have, for the most part, we have multi resolution mesh refined grids. They are Cartesian grids. The type of the equations that we're solving are almost exclusively non linear. We have elliptic, hyperbolic, mixed character, partial differential equations. The tools that we use are very from pseudo spectra solver to method of the line, methods of the line with finite differencing. Our diagnostics typically involve some integral, can be volume or surface integral. And so we perform interpolation, typically using fourth order Hermite interpolation. Code base, it's large code base, it's an open source code, Einstein to cache. Uh, it's a C, C, Fortran, and it's a massively parallel code that we parallelize with OpenMP and MPI. And numerical activity doesn't play very well with GPUs, so we're a very traditional code. And to give you a sense of uh, computational cost of this type of simulations, we're talking about weeks or months of simulation time for, for one simulation. So it's not cheap. Okay. I have a question. Yeah. So if it takes weeks or months on yep. supercomputers, do you test a scaled down version of the code on your computer first before giving it to a supercomputer? Yes. So uh, the memory requirement for what, each one of these simulations typically is so large that on my computer, it, no simulation that makes sense fits. So I typically run on, on supercomputers, but I, uh, yeah, it's true that I run much smaller tests to understand what happens, and then I run the full production jobs. Because if there isn't some error, then weeks or yeah, months just go. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Yeah, so yeah. I, I have a question on the GPU yeah. part. Yeah. Uh, so you said the equations, the algorithm is too complicated, so yeah. people haven't done the GPU, or did someone try the GPU and then it doesn't scale? Yeah, so, so that's a great question. Uh, so fundamentally, the type of calculations that we do uh, don't lend itself to to a massively parallel type, type of calculation that you will do on a GPU. So there's a something fundamental in the type of calculations that we do. Uh, for example, we have a lot of uh, branching uh, for for various reasons. Uh, there's a we have sub cycling in time. So it, it's it's a complex type of algorithm. Someone did implement this for a simplified version, and it didn't. It was more of an academic exercise than a than a real you know production work. Uh, but we are moving to a new infrastructure that by design plays much better with GPUs. So maybe in a few, few years, we're going to have something that will run on GPUs, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to be better. Like the type of calculations don't lend themselves to, to be parallelized on GPUs. Okay, so, so I think with that, we can move to some applications. So first I want to tell you about Black Holes in Charge. Why in your studies you've never found you know, this, the words buckle and charge in the same paragraph. Well, this might be one of the reasons. I'm going to give you a very simplified idea for why um, people assume that astrophysical black holes should be neutral. And the idea is this. Let's consider a black hole of charge Q and mass M. For, let, let's make it possible just for the discussion. Let's consider a project. Let, let, let's assume they were in Newtonian setting. Uh, and right. So let's ask the question. When do we have accretion? Well, we have accretion if and all the if the balance of forces in such a way that, you know, depending on my reference frame, whatever, you know, we have this inequality. You know, since I'm using units that are very convenient, I can write down my Coulomb force, my Newton law, and I get this inequality. Accretion happens if and all that if the charge to mass ratio for the black hole is smaller than the inverse of the charge to mass ratio for a proton. And I ask you to remember one number. The number is the charge to mass ratio for a proton, which is a very, very large number. So accretion happens if and only if the charge to mass ratio for, for the black hole is smaller than zero. So what it means is that let's suppose that we have a star that collapses and form a very highly charged black hole. So a black hole that starts with a large Q over M, then this black hole is going to always accrete particles of the opposite side, because you know that's free. But it's not going to accrete particle of the same side. So effectively, you have a negative current, you're discharging the black hole. So that's why we have the assumption that black holes should be neutral, because if they were not, we'll just discharge them. This is a very simplified argument. Uh, it doesn't take into account relativity. It doesn't take into account that maybe this problem actually moves out. Maybe it's part of the accretion disk. Uh, uh, but at its core, it contains something that, that 
that's really common across all these arguments. That is an inequality of this form. The, the fundamental reason why we believe black holes should be neutral is because the charge to mass ratio for a proton is a very, very, very large number. In other words, the electromagnet is much, much, much stronger than gravity. And I'm going to go back into that and discussing that in a, in a second. But first, I want to tell you, this is an argument. What about observations? Well, we don't really have observations of charged black holes except one. That is uh, this line of work by this group that tried to constrain the charge for Sagittarius and star. And the way they did this was, OK, your black hole has charge, so we're going to change. It, it, it has to change the structure of the disk because you have an electromagnetic field. If you change the structure of the equation disk, you're going to change the emission properties because you have new velocities, temperatures. And if you change the emission properties, well, we can model that and we can constrain that. So this group constraining the charge of Sagittarius A star by modeling what happens if you have a charged body uh, at its center and how this affects the disk and how this affects the uh, emission. But you know, you can probably guess that this is not a super, super robust way. You know, the, you know EHC taught us that modeling accretion flows around Sagittarius is extremely difficult. It right? took lots of people for the amazing results that we have from, EH, from EHT. So this, uh, at least, it depends on the model that you're picking. Constraints on charge from observations are not existent or are very model dependent. But we can do better. We can do better. And the reason I'm very interested in and in placing a constraint on the charge of black holes is because what if, let's, let's put a game, what if I gave you compelling evidence that black holes should be charged? There's observational evidence black holes are charged. Well, that will definitely question, make you question your beliefs on black hole formation, on how they evolve in their environment. So, so it's important to know that indeed, there's a theoretical argument, indeed that, that's what happens. Because if that was not what ha happened, well, we probably we should go back and understand better about our astrophysics. And this is even more important when you go back to those exotic astrophysical theories. Because I told you that the key quantity here is the charge to mass ratio for a proton. But what if I change that? And actually, it doesn't take too much to change this charge to mass ratio for a proton. I can consider a different fundamental particle. There's dark matter theories that say, you know, the, you can have a very, 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 very small, 10 to the 10 times, or even better, uh, smaller uh, charge to mass ratio for the fundamental dark matter particle. Or you can have dark electromagnetism that will have a completely different coupling, so we'll have black holes with dark charge. Or you can have magnetic multiples that wouldn't discharge. Or you can even go to modified gravity, because you can have a form of gravitational charge. And I'm going to discuss this STDG in a second. This is scalar versus scalar tensor vector gravity, not to be confused with scalar vector tensor gravity, <laughs> which is a different theory. This um, assumes or finds the black holes or any object not only has mass, but has also charge that depends on the coupling of the theory. So every single object in the universe has a non-zero charge to mass ratio. So maybe you know our charge is that charge, it's a gravitational charge. And we want to constrain all of this. We want to exclude, we want to place bounds. So, so you cannot do that with uh, looking at the uh, emission from a disk. But you can do that with gravitational waves. Because think about it. If you have charge, you have electromagnetic energy in your system. If you have electromagnetic energy in your system, you're in picture in two black holes orbiting. If you have electromagnetic energy, then you're going to, you know, energy equal mass and relativity, you're going to affect the space time curvature, you're going to affect the orbital dynamics. And that, in turn, leaves an imprint in gravitational waves. Gravitational waves know about the charge of the system. So we can use gravitational waves to constrain the charge of the system. We can use gravitational waves to constrain the charge of astrophysical black holes. And the strength of this approach is, well, first of all, it doesn't take as much modeling. We don't have to understand the details of the equation flow around every single black hole. And second, this works perfectly well with every single modified theory or exotic astrophysical theory I mentioned before. It's a very um, general approach. So in one go, we can constrain a large class of theories. So we're going to do that. And this is what, what it, that's the, this is the effect of charge on the gravitational waves from a binary black holes. Here, we, we can see our 
uh, charge binary that you can tell from the electric field. You can maybe you can see this blob. Here we can see the different uh, gravitational wave emission compared to a preference uncharged case. So they are different. Since they're different, well, we can use data to constrain this. And in particular, I want to point out that they're mostly different in the so-called spiral, and they're not as different in the merger. So the specific classes of gravitational wave signals, they're optimally suited for this type of constraint. What we're going to do so is to consider one specific signal. We're going to consider GW1509.2. This is the first confirmed um, gravitational wave signal. It was uh, uh, detected on the 15th of September of uh, eight years ago, right? And it's one of the best characterized, as you can guess. So it's very loud, signal to noise ratio of about 25. It's more or less equal mass, a binary with a mass ratio of one. And interestingly, there was coincident electromagnetic uh, signal. And if you have moving charges and black holes, you're going to have electromagnetic signal. But I'm going to discuss that in a second. Ideally, what we would like to do is, well, take this signal, perform full vision analysis, get the charge, say, okay, it's zero, we're done. Mm -hmm. uh, but we cannot do that. We cannot do that because in order to be able to do that, we need models with charge. We need full numerical relativity, full generativistic models that include charge. And those didn't exist before us, and they're still not possible. So the question, the way we're going to approach this problem is, well, this is the signal. Uh, as you say, it's quite noisy, and I'm going to, again, to, to go back into that in a second. How much charge can it hit in here? That's the question I'm, I'm going to, to, to discuss in a second. Uh, but first, I want to tell you about this uh, coincident electromagnetic uh, detection and why I'm going to completely ignore it. I'm going to ignore it. And this, you can see it's a beautiful wave. That's an electromagnetic wave. Uh, so this is from, from our simulation. You can see waves are propagating. Indeed, there is electromagnetic waves. but there's a big difference between electromagnetic and gravitational waves. Gravitational waves just free stream. There's nothing more or less that happens from the source to our detector. There's no contamination. There's nothing. That's not what happens with electromagnetic waves. When you have electromagnetic waves, well, there's a plasma. And the frequency of these waves is really, really small. So, so they're going to interact with the plasma. They're going to be absorbed by the plasma. They're going to be reprocessed. And who knows what happens if we want to understand what happens to the electromagnetic energy that is lost during the spiral, we need to understand, we need to model the environment. Uh, but that, uh, that, that's difficult, and that, and that goes against our idea of going beyond just electromagnetism. We want to be able to test all the theories that are not electromagnetism. And when you have dark charge, who knows what happens to dark electromagnetic waves? So we only focus uh, on gravitational waves because they allow us to constrain a large class of theories and because they allow us to ignore all the propagation effects. So the, just a order of magnitude, what's the what's what's the magnitude of the the emission in say some canonical charge to mass ratio case that you've done compared to something else that you would have like the a energy emission? amount of energy? Yeah in, in the in the electromagnetic yeah so so I, I'm going to try to compute a on the go and the way I'm going to do that is I know that for W15 and I14, the amount of energy that was lost through uh, gravitational waves is a order of uh, solar mass, one solar mass. For a, a charge of uh, 0.1, charge mass ratio of 0.1, which is not super high, you will get 1% of that, okay. more or less. So, so this is a lot of energy, 10 to the 50 by or x4 to the 15 and I14, order of that. So it's a lot of energy. Um, okay, so how are we, we going to use exactly or specifically gravitational waves for, for this constraint. What I'm going to do is I'm going to do what we call a mismatch analysis. I'm going to run a large array of simulations. For each simulation, I'm going to ask this question. So with increasing values of charge, I'm going to ask the question, okay, let's take the simulation with charge. Let's take a GW1509.14 without charge. And if I consider the noise that was detected, oh, in coincidence with GW1509.14, do I have enough signal if I marginalize over all the degeneracies, over all the unknown? Do I have enough signal to tell those simulations apart? Or the noise is so large that I, I cannot distinguish them? If I have enough signal, in which case this is magical number 25, if I have enough signal, then I can constrain the charge. If, because if that was GW15 on I14, we would have detected that. We would say, okay, that's not a neutral 
there must be something else. So with this, we can run an array of simulations and find the maximum charge that is allowed still compatible with what we detect as GW1509.8. This will set a limit for, for the charge that is compatible with our data. And the result is, well, uh, depending on your charge configuration, uh, so if you have same charge, opposite charge, or just one or two block of charge, we get a limit of order of 0.4. And the maximum charge that is allowed for, for a black hole is one. You cannot have more than, than one. So 0.4 doesn't seem too, too large. It's 40% of the maximum, maximum value that is allowed. But then I like to cast this, this, this number into a different metric. I like to think if we specialize to the case of electromagnetism, so you know, usual protons and, and electrons, this 0.4 means that we constrained the charge imbalance in GW1514 to be smaller than 10 to the minus 17 solar masses. So the difference between the electron and proton seems to be, has to be like such a tiny number, which is kind of cute. So this was the first constraint from gravitational waves from strong field, gravitational waves uh, for the charged black hole. And as an exercise, we can translate this constraint into other exotic modified theories of gravity, for example, the scalar vector tensor gravity, uh, that theory that in, will predict the, that every object has some gravitational charge. And we constrain its coupling parameter to be smaller than 0.19, where alpha equals zero is zero, and where the previous constraint was order of, order of nine. So we improved the constraint by a factor of 100. So we are ruling, up, ruling this out. And again, these were the first and so far only constraints using um, full uh, generativistic simulations of charged black holes using gravitational wave data. But shortly uh, after our paper, um, someone did a different analysis, considering a very specific part of the signal, the, uh, what happens after merger, uh, Grigori Karuno from the Perfect Collaboration, uh, look at the post-merger phase and found the same result. If we consider GWP for this, this is the posterior, so which I don't know if you can see, but there is a point four, which happens to be exactly the same point four. So it seems that from, from a different perspective, different type of analysis on the same data, two different methods are converging on the same type of constraint. So I'd say that now this is the state of the art. This is the best. If you want to constrain a charge of black holes, want to do it in a model independent way, if you want to use gravitational waves, this is the best you can do. So order of point four. Is this the only event that's suitable for this kind of comparison? So the most important quantity for this type of constraint is the signal to noise ratio that you have. This is one of the highest, and it's it's quite it's long enough. So we have enough cycles that we can do this well. Uh, but here you can see the other constraints from from the other events, all these lines. And as you can see, the best one is still to the you know, uh, If you want to constrain the charge, the best. Well, again, using this type of techniques, the best is to look for very long spirals, so for low mass ratio uh, with current technology. But what if we have better technology? What if we have 3G detectors, future detectors? Well, that's exactly what happened in the next slide. Uh, so I asked myself, okay, what if we had GW15 or 914, uh, but in 15 years? So, so in this plot, I'm showing a series of future detectors, advanced LIGO, A+, which is advanced, advanced LIGO, Voyager, which is advanced, advanced, advanced LIGO, Einstein Telescope and Cosmic Explorer. And on the y-axis, I'm, I'm asking, how much signal-to-noise ratio do I need for an event like GW15 or 914 to constrain the charge to be smaller than, say, 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3? I can charge me for charge mass ratio. So first, we can see that, uh, well, if I want to constrain the charge to a smaller volume, so to be smaller than 0.1, I need more signal-to-noise ratio. So the noise has to be well, smaller than the signal. If I want to constrain the level of 0.3, then I don't need as much signature ratio, which makes sense. Uh, the smaller the charge you have, the closer your waveform is going to look like a, a vacuum waveform. So you need more and more signal. But this plot is maybe mis misleading. But first of all, all the uh, different all the different detectors, you know, it doesn't change that much. But most importantly, all the future detectors are going to have an expected signaturization, which is much, much larger than this, like 10 times larger than this. So you know, if I were to actually plot the dynamic range, this will be like a, a very small uh, footer in, the, in this big plot, which means that in the future, every single detector is going to constrain the charge at this level, with every single measurement. And it gets even better for LISA, the LISA Interferometer Space Antenna. 
that's that it's going to constrain the charge at this level on 1.2.3 everywhere in the universe where it detects particles. So, so, but what if we want to do better? What if we want to constrain the charge at 0 0.001? Well, first of all, you can see from the scale, it becomes harder and harder. But second, there's a very fundamental problem. And uh, going towards the end of this talk, I want to tell you about this fundamental problem. If you want to place better constraints, you need much better simulations. And let me tell you something about gravitational wave astronomy. Uh, so in, in the future, we're going to have amazing detectors. We're going to have the laser interferometer space and button. We're going to have the Einstein telescope, and we're going to have the Cosmic Explorer. But already our best waveform, the waveform that we're using right now, the state of the art, is not going to be enough. We're going to be fundamentally limited by the systematics in our models to be able to use the future detectors. So first of all, we need to step up our game. We need to improve how we make models, how accurate those models are. And here I mean our control and numerical error, our systematics and, and details of how we extract gravitational waves. We have to, there's a lot of work that needs to be done in this direction uh, in order to be able to uh, just be prepared for the 3G detectors, future detectors. And second, I think that this is, is a very interesting area where Einstein Maxwell's charge black hole can be, can be useful because it can be used as a fully fledged, fully understood theory uh, to, that it is also an example of modified gravity, something that is not just vacuum, so that we can understand our biases or our degeneracies, and we can, again, be prepared for something that is uh, not what we already have. And again, to, uh, I want to give you a visual sense of, uh, of why this is so important, and so I'm going to tell you how gravitational wave astronomy works. Well, oh, okay, we have it. I thought I had it, so I don't have it. So I <laughs> can find it if there's enough time. Uh, instead, I'm going to uh, so I'm going to tell them now that we have uh, uh, full simulations, we can do uh, things that were not possible before. For example, we can look at the properties of the remnant. So we have two black holes that merge and they uh, they form a remnant, and this remnant could have you know, could be kicked out of the uh, of the host galaxy or cluster because you have a recall, for example, or it could be highly charged or highly spin. Um, so now we can understand what properties this remnant has uh, because we can do the, the entire simulation. And especially we can, we can, again, look at the gravitational and electromagnetic waves recall. So we can, for example, understand if we can, once again, constrain our theories using measured recoils or projected recoils. Second, we have, now we have the full solution. We can go back. We can look at the uh, previous uh, approaches to the problem that maybe were analytical but had some approximations. We can benchmark those approaches. We can understand which regimes those approaches work, should be used, and which regime they shouldn't be used, like, like, like here I'm showing, comparison between analytical and non-analytical uh, numerical waveform. And finally, something quite interesting that, again, relates to this business with uh, remnants is that um, it's known that uh, black holes, since you only need three parameters to describe it, charge, mass, and angular momentum, if you have just one black hole, which is what you have after the merger, um, then you can fully characterize um, the emission properties, gravitational wave, in this case, electromagnetic waves as well, just in terms of those three parameters. So maybe we can use those emission properties to constrain uh, the remnant itself. And one of the results that we found, we call this quasi-normal modes, one of the results that we found is that there's a conspiracy. The conspiracy goes that uh, it's impossible to detect charge, at least for small values of charge, just looking at the, the, the quasi-normal modes. And so I'm going to uh, recap. If there's time, I'm going to fetch those slides that disappeared, <laughs> tell you about gravitational wave astronomy. Uh, but to recap, today I told you about um, some advancements in the field of numerical relativity that enabled, well, initial data, and stable evolutions of uh, binary black holes with charge. I told you about the first full generativistic numerical relativity waveforms of binary black holes with charge. I told you about the first constraints from the first simulations on the charge to mass ratio of uh, at least one black hole in the universe. And, and I told you about the future. And I, well, I also told you about going beyond 
Einstein Maxwell or traditional idea of who is charged, and we constrain this coupling parameter and place a hundred times better constraint on the on the, on this coupling. Our goal is to set it to zero eventually. And well, as you can see, there's much more current work uh, than I could, you know, there's plenty of current work uh, because this is, is a very rich field, at least I think. Now that we have our numerical relativity waveform, we can construct a full um, full model that can be used by LIGO, Virgo for full analysis so that I can actually go take the data and do full vision analysis. And LIGO can go and use gravitational waves and measure immediately a charge out of their, out of their data. So if this is this gravitational wave template things. Now we have the technology to do that. There's plenty of interesting questions that are, we're trying to address right now. For example, uh, related to, uh, again, properties of our theories, this idea of cosmic censorship, what happens when you have a uh, binary in spiral with a lot of charge? Um, we're looking into more details about this uh, detectability of uh, uh, quasi-normal modes and as a proxy for modified theories for future detectors. Um, we are looking at what happens when instead of having a quasi circle inspired, you have a hyperbolic encounter. This is significantly different. It's, uh, it's very interesting because uh, there's a this history for the uh, uncharged case of a uh, very well, interesting phenomena of like energy dissipated, for example. And finally, we're actually addressing or trying to model out this problem of you actually have a plasma in the universe. You have the uh, in a solar medium. What happens to the electromagnetic waves? How do they bounce off? How do how do the energy trapped around the binary is going to affect the uh, in spiral or the emission? And with that, I once again acknowledge the support of all these uh, organizations and their fellowships, uh, especially because uh, I'm not American, so I can I could apply to uh, accept internationals. I'm very happy. And I'm going to take questions. And you, one of the possible questions that you can ask me is, can you go back to those slides that are lost in? <laughs> questions for Gabriel. Has the Event Horizon Telescope given any constraints on our networks? Uh, so I think there was a paper on that. So if you just look at the shape of the shadow, I think the constraint is not very strong. So I think there was something, uh, but it was like smaller than 10, like a very, very, very large. Number. So, but it's not officially from the inventory telescope. It's uh, someone else took the data. Okay. Uh, I'm especially interested in your missing slides if they talk a little bit more about how you're making measurements of the remnant. Of what? The remnant? Yes. Uh, no, they're, they they don't talk about measurements. Of, Can you talk about measurements of the remnant <laughs> after you find those beautiful slides? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let me try the slides here. Um, okay, so this is how gravitational wave astronomy works. Uh, so this is an actual thing. This is GW1509 for 10, the signal I've been talking about. Can you see the waveform? No. Uh, so, so the fundamental property of current generation detectors is that noise is much, 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 much larger than the signal. So we have to redefine the signal in this, this mess. So the way this works is that we have models. We, we have expectation of how the signal should look like. So what we do is we brutally take every single model that we have, quite, not quite, but almost, and we have like a matching window that we slide over our data with our model and trying to find where our model fits the data. So where there's agreement. So this is what it looks like. We have our slide, we have our model, we move our window. I say, ah, oh, here, there's a match. This is where the data, this is where the signal is. So once we have that, well, then we can go back. We can clean the data, we can apply all our post-processing tools and we can find that the signal is inside. Well, what's the punchline here? that there's a very, very, very big difference compared to a traditional automated wave astronomy. We have to know in advance what we have to look for. So it's really, really critical that we have models, that we have understanding of our signals if we want to find the signal in the first place, for the most part. As an asterisk, there's a model searches, uh, but typically they're not as effective as so far as zero detections were made with model searches. So, so this business of charged black holes in many ways enables LIGO, if they want to, to look for charge uh, and signals. So to look for signals that contain charge. And second, 
This is the current generation of detectors. The, for the most part, this inequality is going to be flipped in the future. We're going to have a, a lot of signals in message, right? like we're the thousand, which is like 100 times better than now. So it's going to be the opposite. We're going to have a beautiful signal here that we don't know how to fit because our models are not good enough. So, so this, is the, you know, this is where the field of gravitational wave astronomy sits. So this is why people should hire me as a postdoc. <laughs> <laughs> because we need to improve our modeling efforts. We need to have better theoretical models if we want to take advantage of future projects. So these were my three recent slides. You want to address the uh, post, so, the remnant? So about remnants. Um, so let's see what we have about remnants. OK, so, um, so when two black holes merge and they form a single black hole, um, the single black hole is going to have mass, charge, and angular momentum. And uh, initially, you have a perturbed solution. You're going to have that as you have a single black hole, you kick it very hard. So you're going to have fundamental modes of, of solutions. We call them quasi normal modes. And what happens in this specific case is that when you have a merger that has charge versus a merger without charge, the mass angular momentum and charge of the run change. All the three parameters change. And you can think about this. For example, we see our case with a lot of charge and same, same charge. The merger is going to be very, very, very slow. You're going to lose very, very little energy. You're going to lose very, very little angular momentum. So at the end, you're going to have rapidly spinning, high mass, high charge remnant. Probably should be all those small like so small spin. But so so depending on your initial configuration, your final configuration change. And what happens is that it changes in such a way that the fundamental frequency of oscillation change in the same way. So if we just detect those, we cannot tell if the remnant or the merger had charge in the first place. So so this seems uh, to be an uh, interesting axiom that uh, prevents us from looking at uh, 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 prevents us from understanding about the properties of the of the merger, if this was what you were asking. Any other questions for yeah. Have there been any works on how charged black holes would interact with electromagnetic radiation, for instance, in the context of lensing? Uh, so no, there is no, there's been no, so if the question is just if there's work, I don't think there's been any work. If you follow, want to follow up, what's my opinion on that? Uh, I don't yes, know, I have to think perhaps. about it. Uh, I have to think about it, but my first guess is that charged black holes, you know, charges do not affect electromagnetic waves. So the only, you will have exactly the same effect as a, a normal uncharged black hole. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, the space time is going to change. So, so it depends on how close they are, but I don't think there's anything very fundamental about that. There's nothing, so, so you can, I think you can take your space time and do the same lensing analysis you're going to find. There's, there's, I don't think there's anything uh, unexpected there. I have a question about the sort of the idea that like motivated this all this work. Um, you mentioned this the solution of the two black holes that I guess are extremal and they they yeah, sit yeah. still yeah. and they're charged. Yeah. And I'm just wondering like, uh, is that something that that has interesting dynamics or has it just never been looked into? Or so I don't remember. Yeah. So 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 this solution is called the Majunta probability solution, mm -hmm. and the idea is that you put as much charge as you want so that the electromagnetic and gravitational forces they balance. Hmm. So, so you put that and they stay there. I think should be a stable solution. So if you move them around, they're going to you know, stay there. But I don't think there's anything particularly interesting in that solution. Uh, I mean, technically, the most interesting thing is that you transform a nonlinear equation that is a Max, uh, Maxwell equation to a Poisson equation. That's the most interesting aspect why people typically discuss the solution in the first place, because it's how you can simplify the problem. You know, maybe on an expert. Yeah. Interesting. Other questions for Ariela? Well, I'm room N317, if you want to <laughs> questions. All right, that's all. Thank you, Ariela.